Good to worship with you this morning. Hope everything's going well in your week. Um, we've been in a series now for a while entitled OTC. We've been looking at Old Testament characters, examining their life and their story, trying to apply that to our life and our story. As we see their relationship with God, hopefully that brings some insight into uh, deepening our relationship with Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at Isaiah, and we built the message around four words. I wanted you to remember four words. If you were here last week, I hope you remember those four words. This morning, though, I'm going to reduce it even more. I'm going to bring it down to one word. I just want you to remember one word this morning, and that's the word opportunity. Now, the word opportunity actually has several definitions, but I found two that I really like. One is to be in a good position for advancement or success. So an opportunity is to be in a good position for advancement or success. Second is a favorable juncture of circumstances. So to be, in a, to be given an opportunity suggests that you've been put in a good position, a position to succeed. You've been placed at a crossroads, if you will. And if you will take advantage of that opportunity, then good things will happen. This morning we're going to be in Exodus. Uh, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 2, and today's OTC is Moses. Now, we can't cover all of Moses' life in one message, obviously. So we're going to kind of camp out a little bit around the burning bush, but it's all going to hone around this one word and this one spiritual concept of opportunity. Because as I go through Moses' story, it seems to me that he was given three opportunities that changed the course of his life. And I think in application, we're given those same three uh, opportunities, and if we will apply those, uh, it'll change the course of our life as well. So here's the first opportunity that Moses was given. It was the opportunity to know God. He's given the opportunity to know God. We see this first in chapter 2, verse 1, at his birth. It says, Now a man of, man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the, the river bank. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Now, you may remember the context here. The Israelites are living in Egypt. They've been... Uh, in, pushed into forced labor. They are so numerous now that Pharaoh's getting really nervous, and so now he has executed an order that all the newborn male babies would be killed. So when Moses is born, his mother is able to hide him for a few months. Once she realizes she can't hide him anymore, she puts him in the basket and puts him on the river. But here's the key point. Moses' life was spared. And in his sovereignty, God made a way for Moses to live. And in that opportunity, gave him the opportunity to know God. It just reminds us that birth itself is a miraculous and tremendous opportunity that we have to know God. Psalm 78, 6, it's talking about telling the next generation about God and his praiseworthy deeds. It says, so that... Even the children yet to be born would in turn tell their children. Seems like kind of an odd passage, an odd phrase talking about children not yet even born. But what it's talking about is we should be so much about speaking the, the, the goodness of God that as soon as children are born, they're hearing about the good things of God so that they're ready to say the same thing even before their children are born. But it connects this concept of birth and the opportunity to know God. In Deuteronomy 32, 18, the children of Israel have been reprimanded. It says, you deserve the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Again, we see the connection of birth being this opportunity to know God. Unfortunately, the Israelites didn't take advantage of the opportunity. 
So we see this opportunity in birth, but we see it even more vividly in the burning bush. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says that, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses said that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Now this experience took place about 80 years after his birth. But at this bush, it's a great opportunity for Moses to know God, both who he is and what he does. Now, how much Moses knew about God uh, before this bush experience, it's very unclear. It's unknown. We have really no idea. But Moses learns a lot about God at this experience at the bush because God identifies who he is. In verse 6, God says to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, I don't know how well um, Moses knew the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now he learns that the one he's talking to is the God of his father. In verse 14, God even gives him more of a self-identification. He says, I am who I am. Verse 14, it says, God said to Moses, I am who I am, and this is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am sent me to you. Now, this phrase alone tells Moses much about God. It tells us a lot about God as well. In the Hebrew, this is a self-designation that has no time restraints, no time connection. So the, the phrase, I am who I am, could, you could say, I am who I was. I am who I will be. I will be who I was. I will be who I will be. I am what I caused to be. In other words, the name and nature of God here is presented as being so full of meaning that no human expression can contain it or define it. The nature of an infinite God cannot be expressed in, in finite human words. Psalm 145, 3 says, Great is the Lord, most worthy to be praised, and His greatness no one can fathom. So God identifies himself to Moses, gives Moses the opportunity to know who he is by this phrase, I am who I am. That tells us a lot about God. One, it tells us that God cannot be defiled. He is holy, and he will never be anything but holy. He can never become unholy. It tells us that God cannot be destroyed. He will never cease to exist. It tells us that God is eternal. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Nothing existed before Him, and nothing's going to outlive Him. He will never cease to exist. It tells us that God is independent. He exists in and of Himself. He doesn't need anyone or anything to help Him exist. He is completely self-sufficient and self-sustaining. God is not limited He's not limited by space. He's omnipresent. He's not limited in power. He's omnipotent. He's not limited in his wisdom and his knowledge. He is omniscient. He's not limited in his resources. His riches are unsearchable. And all of this wrapped up when God says, I am who I am, this is what he's communicating to Moses to give him the opportunity to know who he is. So he gets this opportunity not only to know who he is, but to know what he can do. When you go to chapter 4, you see that God turns Moses' staff into a snake. And then he turns the snake back into his staff. He has Moses put his hand in his coat and take it out, and it's, it's leprous. He has him stick it back in and pull it out, and it's clean and whole again. So he's showing Moses who he is and what he can do. And this is critical for Moses because of what God's going to ask him to do in the near future. But the point here is that God has given Moses the opportunity to know him at this bush. Let me give you a, an analogy. I'm sure you've noticed this giraffe by now. You may have been wondering, what is the giraffe standing up here on the stage for? What's Daryl going to do with that? So maybe it's created some curiosity. What is that? 
Why is it here? What's it made out of? Who actually spent the time to make that? Maybe those kind of things have been kind of going through your mind as we've been sitting here. Here's the point, though. Simply by the fact that you're sitting in this room, simply because you're, you're here, you've seen this and been exposed to this giraffe. The analogy is this. Just because you exist, the fact that you exist has given you the opportunity to, to know God and to be exposed to who He is. Romans 1.20 says, All of God's invisible attributes, including His eternal power and His divine nature, have been clearly seen through creation. So through creation, you've been given the opportunity to know God. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave us His Son. But Hebrews 1.3 about the Son says, He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. In other words, through who Jesus is and what He has done for us, we've been given the opportunity to know God. In Hebrews and in 2 Timothy, we, we see that He's talking about the Word of God and that we've been given the opportunity to know God through His Word. The Spirit of God is always active and moving. He is drawing us to Himself. He is convicting us of sin. So the Spirit is one who has always given us the opportunity to know God. Once we receive Christ, we receive the Spirit. Now with the Spirit living in us, we really have the opportunity to know Him even more deeply. So what all this is telling us is that through creation, through the Word of God, through the Son of God, through the Spirit of God, just because we are here in this place, we've been given the opportunity to know God. Now, what, what, what would you do if I were to say, okay, you've seen this giraffe, but after the service is over, if you would like to, I would invite you to come and just check it out a little more closely. You can come and you can kind of feel it and see what it's made out of and how much it weighs and just all the intricacies. I'd give you the opportunity to take a closer look and examine it more closely. If I were to make that invitation... Some of you might take advantage of that opportunity and come up here and do it. Some of you would say, no, thank you, I'm good. That's the way it is with God. God has given us the opportunity to know Him, but He's also given us the opportunity to know Him more and to know Him more deeply through His Son and through His Spirit. And there are some that take advantage of that and say, yes, I would like to know you more. And then some would say, no, thank you, I'm good. But the first opportunity that Moses gets is the opportunity to know God. And we have the same opportunity. The second opportunity is the opportunity to choose God. And it's happened for Moses simultaneously. Here at the bush, not only is he getting the opportunity to know God, but simultaneously he's getting the opportunity to choose God. Remember, the first 40 years of Moses' life was spent in Pharaoh's household. And we actually know virtually nothing about those 40 years of Moses' life. Really all we have is Exodus 2.10 that says, When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses. That's really all we know about those 40 years of his life. But the indication is that he was raised in the household of Pharaoh. So he got to enjoy all the riches of the household of Pharaoh. He got to enjoy all the pleasures of the household of Pharaoh. He got to enjoy the education and be trained and equipped in the household of Pharaoh. But we see in his story that at the end of those 40 years, he goes out and he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And so he kills the Egyptian. And in fear of his life, he flees to Midian. And he spends the next 40 years in Midian. And we actually know very little about those 40 years as well. Now, we do know that he, from chapter 2, that he starts to work for a man named Jethro. He marries his daughter, has a son. So the indication here is that he sets up a very comfortable life. He has a wife. He has a family. He has a job. He's kind of made peace. He says, I'm an alien in this country. He's kind of made peace where he is. And so now he's set himself up with a very comfortable life. But then the bush experience 
And now he's faced with this decision, this choice, this opportunity to choose God or not. Now, for Moses, he makes the right choice. But consider the choice just for a moment. On one side, he chooses not to stay in his comfortable lifestyle. Okay, he's living a comfortable life. He could have said, you know what, I've got a wife, I've got a son, I've got a a pretty good job, I'm really comfortable, I'm set up, things are kind of easy, I don't have a lot of of temptation, frustration, and and things are good. But he gives up that comfortable lifestyle, he chooses God instead. In Hebrews chapter 11, we see even greater depth to what this choice really involved. In Hebrews 11 verse 24, it says that by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. In this phrase, the word chose means to prefer. The word enjoy means to hold on to. So here's really what's taking place. It says that Moses preferred to be mistreated with the people of God than to hang on to all the pleasures that he was enjoying in the Pharaoh's household. So Moses does not choose the comfortable life. He does not choose the pleasure-filled life. Rather, he chooses the life of mistreatment and following after God. Why in the world would you choose persecution over pleasure? Why would he make that choice? Let me give you another little analogy. I've got two items here that represents two concepts. Okay, here I just have some some weights. And then here I have some donuts. And so the weights represent working out, and the donuts represent pigging out. So let's say I have a choice every morning. I can choose to get up every morning and work out. Or I can choose every morning to get up and pig out on six donuts every morning. So why in the world would I choose working out versus pigging out? With the weights, I'm going to be there. I'm, I'm working hard. I'm, I'm doing push-ups. I'm lifting weights. Maybe you're running. Maybe you're doing cardio. Maybe you're doing all this stuff. But the next day, you're sore and you're tired. And, you're, and it's, it's, it's work, okay? The donuts, all you do is just sit there and eat. Why would you choose working out over the donuts if you had the choice. Well, the reason is because of this concept of long-term versus short-term. Long-term impact and results versus this short-term. Here's why you would choose to work out. You know that if you work out long-term, you're going to be physically more fit. You're going to be physically more healthy when you work out. Now, in the short-term, it may be hard, may be some discomfort, There may be some pain, there may be some soreness, but you know when that's a part of my life long term, it's going to result in some good physical health. But with donuts, I may enjoy some great short-term satisfaction and pleasure, but if I eat six donuts every morning, the long-term consequence is going to damage my health physically. So I'm going to choose the persecution over pleasure because of the long term versus the short term. Now, bring that into context now with Moses and his decision. Why did he choose mistreatment with the people of God versus the pleasures of the kingdom of Pharaoh? He tells us in Hebrews eleven twenty five, he did not want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He understood the pleasures would only last a short time. Verse 26 continues and says, Moses, he puts it in kind of a, 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 a New Testament context. He says, Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. If you continue to verse 40 in Hebrews 11, we see about those that suffered persecution and even were martyred for their faith. The reason they were willing to do that, it says, is because they knew that God had planned something better. 
They knew that what God offered was much better than what the world offered, that the next life was going to be much greater than this life. And so they were willing to go through the mistreatment. It's this concept between the short term and the long term. So why in the world would we make a decision that says, I will follow Christ even though it may lead to some mistreatment and to some persecution and to some pain and some difficult days? Why would I choose Christ over sin and over pleasure. It's because of the long-term results. We have a choice. We have an opportunity to choose God. And here's the truth. In your life, you can, you can play the long game or you can play the short game. You can live with just this moment in mind or you can live with eternity in mind. You can live in a way that just pacifies your your flesh temporarily, or you can live in a way that will satisfy your soul completely. But you have the opportunity to choose. The third opportunity we see here with Moses is the opportunity to be used by God. And again, it's all simultaneous. All this is taking place at the same time. Moses is at this burning bush. He's got these three great opportunities. He's got the opportunity to know God, the opportunity to choose God, and the opportunity to be used by God. Look in uh, chapter 3, verse 9. Moses says, I mean, God says to Moses, Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So at the bush, God's giving Moses the opportunity to be used by God. But if you read through the story, you see that Moses is really reluctant at first. I don't think Moses really saw this as a great opportunity right off the bat. Because you hear his excuses. You see, he starts to make all these excuses why he doesn't really want to take advantage of this opportunity. In chapter 3, verse 11, we see his fear of inadequacy. He says, who am I? He's basically saying, man, you've got the wrong guy. I'm a nobody. Nobody knows who I am. I have no clout with the Pharaoh. I have no clout with the, with the Hebrews. I'm a nobody. I'm the least likely person to be able to accomplish this. He feels inadequate. In chapter 4, verse 1, we see his fear of opposition. He says, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? The translation here is, okay, what if I do it and get up there and they give me resistance, they give me opposition, they give me challenges, they won't listen, they won't obey, they start to fight me. What am I going to do then? Chapter 4, verse 10 we see his fear of failure. It's tied into his fear of inadequacy and opposition. He says, I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. What he's saying is, okay, if I, if I decide to do this and I realize because I'm inadequate and because of the, of the opposition, I fail. I'm not going to be able to carry this task to fruition. What now? So a beginning at the beginning, Moses doesn't really see being used by God as an opportunity. <laughs> It's like, no. But fortunately, as he walks through this conversation with God, he comes to the place where he sees it as an opportunity. He, he, he lets go of that anxiety and hesitation and reluctance and fear and takes the opportunity. Can you relate to Moses at all? When you feel like God's calling you to do something and that the reluctance, the, the fear, the inadequacy, all that stuff kind of rises up inside of you to try to make an excuse as to why I can't be used by God or why I don't want to be used by God. That's what's going through here with Moses. I think a lot of times maybe we see the opportunity to be used by God not as an opportunity. It's more like, uh, it's like punishment. But here's the truth. To be used by God is a glorious opportunity. To be used by God is an opportunity to, to impact people's lives forever. It's an opportunity to impact people's lives for eternity. To be used by God is an opportunity 
to minister to people in need. It's an opportunity to comfort people in pain. It's an opportunity to give direction to people who are lost. It's an opportunity to restore people who are broken. It's an opportunity to to share words of life and hope to those who are feeling lifeless and hopeless. It's a glorious, wonderful opportunity to know that God in His great plan and His great purpose wants to use me so that I can be part of something much bigger than myself, something much greater than myself, something much glorious than myself, and God can and will actually use me to make an eternal impact in people's lives. It's a glorious opportunity that we, may we see it as an opportunity rather than a burden. Let me finish on the final note. We've seen here that Moses has been given the opportunity to know God, choose God, and then be used by God. We have the same opportunity. The good news is it's not a one-time opportunity. When you look at the story of Moses, it wasn't just at the burning bush where he had those opportunities. Every single day of his life, he had those three opportunities. Every morning when he woke up, he had the opportunity to know God more, to know God more deeply, and he took advantage of it. He went up on the mountain with God time and time again and spent time with God in prayer. He took every day as an opportunity. Every day he had the opportunity to choose God anew. And some days that choice might have been difficult because we know his story. We know the pain and the turmoil and the persecution, the tribulation, all the stuff that he had to endure and put up with. But every single day, even in the hard days, he chose, I choose God. Every day he had the opportunity to choose anew to be used by God. He could have bailed out at any moment, but every day he chose The same opportunity as ours. Every single day of your life, you have the opportunity to know God more deeply, to choose him again, even in the midst of some of the hard things that you have to endure in this life, to say, no, I know who he is, I know what he can do, and I choose him every day. And every day you have the opportunity to say, yes, I am willing and ready to be used by God. The question is, Will you take advantage of the opportunities? Would you bow with me? I pray the Spirit can give insight into these opportunities that God's given you. And as you allow the Spirit to minister and speak, may you just Ask, are these, any of these opportunities ones that you're not taking advantage of? Father, we pray at this moment that your spirit would, would just speak, would minister. Father, I know all of us, we're, we're different people. We have different needs. We're in different places, different things going on in our life. But, Father, you know every story here. And I just pray that you would minister accordingly, that you would do exactly what needs to be done in every single person in this room, that you would speak the words that each of us need to hear, exactly what each of us need to hear in these moments. We acknowledge you as the great I am. And Father, we understand what that means and we pray that you would continue to make it even more clear in our heart and spirit how majestic and glorious and wonderful you are. So in these moments, would you continue to speak to us, continue to minister to us. With your heads bowed, I just want to give you a moment to prepare your heart. We're going to Observe communion here in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to give you some time just between you and the Lord.